Topcrimineel uh, Ridwan Taghi. De meest gezochte crimineel van Nederland, Ridwan Taghi. Taghi is onderdeel van een groot internationaal drugskartel. In the shadows of the Netherlands for years, an enigmatic figure has emerged to become the absolute godfather of organized crime, Ridwan Taghi. Wielding his power from the top of a feared organization, he has wreaked terror without the slightest empathy, leaving the country in constant anxiety. Vooralsnog heb ik nog niks te melden. As the gigantic trial against his group draws to a close, the crime continues unabated, as does the relentless pursuit of Tahi's associates by the forces of law and order, wherever they may be hiding in the world. Let's go back to the origins of his story. Ridwan was born in 1977 in the north of Morocco, precisely in the rural municipality of Beni Salman, located in the province of Chefchaouen. Three years later, his family decided to migrate to the Netherlands and settled near Utrecht in the town of Vienna. From a young age, Ridouan demonstrates remarkable academic abilities and harbors great ambitions that lead him to pursue pre-university studies, which he eventually abandons without obtaining a diploma. Ridouan indeed takes his first steps into the criminal world by engaging in the sale of hashish at Neuerheim School, both in the schoolyard and near the exit. During this time, he also becomes a target of racketeers, stronger guys seeking to take advantage of his small business. According to different sources, his nickname, Decline, meaning the little one, also dates back to this period. However, Ridwan, who was once a shy and introverted child, now displays unwavering determination to become a prominent player, inevitably leading him towards a criminal career. In the early 90s, he joins a street gang called the Bad Boys, consisting of around 50 youngsters from Neuerheim, Utrecht and other nearby cities. These youths engage in various criminal offences, such as robberies, burglaries, but most importantly, car races, to feel the adrenaline rushing through their veins. The troubled common past of the most problematic gang members brings them closer, creating strong bonds of trust. Shortly after, a smaller core group forms and Ridwan gradually assumes the role of a leader. His friend from Utrecht, Mao, plays a key role as his left-hand man, accompanied by his younger brother Mario, who soon joins the team. As time goes by, the small deals in front of the city plaza shopping center in Neuerheim become distant memories, and it is now time to turn towards more lucrative business. Ridwan, who dropped out of school before even reaching the age of 18, sees potential great opportunities in drug trafficking. It is important to understand that since the 1970s, Smuggling into the Netherlands from Morocco through Spain has been mainly orchestrated by a small group of Moroccan traders based in Amsterdam and Utrecht. These individuals all know each other and manage to operate discreetly, evading police radars and vigilance. They form a closed circle that leverages family connections with cannabis growers in the mountainous Rif region in northern Morocco. We could even liken all this to a kind of family business that has endured for several generations. For Ridouan, the goal is clear. He aims to carve a place for himself within this highly closed circle of the underworld. Spending more and more time in various coffee shops in major cities, he works tirelessly to expand his network and he succeeds brilliantly. This is hardly surprising since he has the authorization to operate some of the cannabis routes established by his grandfather, which gives him a certain added value in the eyes of major players in the milieu. This partial advantage, 
partly explains why he is considered a rising star within his own network, born from the Bad Boys gang. Despite the advantage of his high-quality contacts, Ridwan still has to play by the rules and start from the lower ranks before climbing to the top. He gradually increases his presence in Spain, taking charge of the logistics aspect of his operations. His process involves transferring the merchandise from Morocco to the southern coast of Spain before distributing it more widely across Europe. He doesn't rest on his laurels and invests in powerful outboard motors in the Netherlands, which he later transports to Morocco for use on speedboats. Thus, he devises perfectly optimized routes to reach the beaches on the other side of the sea. At this stage, Ridouan continues to work for bosses based in Utrecht and Amsterdam, who grant him a commission of around 150 euros per kilo of smuggled merchandise. These profits accumulate rapidly, especially as the total volume transported can be significantly multiplied over time. It is also essential to mention the crucial element of the expansion of his network, which takes shape at the turn of the century, thanks to the organization led by Said Razuki from Utrecht, now considered his undisputed right-hand man. This combination of events further accelerates Ridouan's ascent, leading to a considerable growth of his financial wealth. In addition to transporting hashish blocks for Dutch sponsors, Ridouan cleverly optimizes his speedboats by gradually adding his own merchandise, which he purchases from Moroccan suppliers and then sells to contacts in the Dutch coffee shops. After years of emulating the best, he finally decides to launch his own enterprise with his own lines, using the capital he has already amassed. He masters his process perfectly, which involves multiple steps. Indeed, ensuring the smooth functioning of logistics requires the indispensable presence of a competent team of transporters, a team specialized in recovering the blocks from the speedboats as well as a team responsible for land transportation, not to mention the infiltration of corrupt officials in the milieu. In other words, a solid infrastructure is crucial to ensure the sustainability of the activity, particularly in the face of constant changes and the phenomenal increase in cargo volumes. While a few hundred kilograms were once considered remarkable, it's now several tons per shipment. Thus, maintaining optimal operational efficiency becomes essential to adapt to all these changes and evolutions. But fate is not always favorable for Ridouan, as in 2004, he becomes a suspect in a criminal case in Spain. According to the accusations, he allegedly stabbed an Interpol agent in an Ibis hotel in Alicante. Aware of the risk of being identified and arrested by local authorities, he decides to travel to Morocco. And from there, he continues to orchestrate his activities. It is important to mention here that several years later, he will eventually be declared innocent in this case. However, it is not surprising that Ridouan spent a significant part of this period in Morocco. Indeed, by the late 2000s, a new generation of the Mokro emerged, turning to the coke trade, offering astronomical profits. And Morocco plays a crucial role as an essential link in the logistical chain of this lucrative trade, shaped by the new trends of South American cartels who exploit new routes to smuggle their powder into Europe. It is important to be aware of the increasing scale of cargo seizures in European ports, leading to constant reconfiguration of routes between South America and Europe. In this regard, many traffickers have opted to use West African ports as a preferred route as an alternative. Thus, smugglers are tasked with transporting drugs to Europe, passing through Morocco, 
which occupies a key strategic position to facilitate this transit. Indeed, members of the Mokro Mafia, present both in Morocco and Europe, fully take advantage of this opportunity. Their presence in major ports gives them a significant advantage in facilitating the passage of cartel products into the European market. Ridouan, still as determined as ever, does not simply stay behind, but rapidly advances in this new era. He reportedly made a series of astute decisions, such as acquiring strategically located real estate in Morocco and establishing a number of fishing companies along the country's west coast. These companies serve as perfect covers, using fishermen as key players in his logistics. Relentlessly navigating their fishing boats at sea, they relentlessly pursue valuable shipments that need to be transshipped for further step in the supply chain. As this phenomenon thrives, the police in the Netherlands are lagging behind, mainly focusing on the old generation of Dutch criminals who make headlines in the news. The new generation of the Mokro is advancing rapidly and can no longer be ignored as they are no longer content with playing a marginal role in the underworld as mere soldiers. As time goes on, detectives begin to question the situation. The names of these former young criminals are barely mentioned in the police records, yet they are seen investing heavily in the restaurant industry and driving high-value cars. This only strengthens the suspicions. Ridouan himself was allegedly involved in managing a thriving grill restaurant on a commercial street in Utrecht. Over time, the little one gradually reduces his presence in the Netherlands. By 2008, he mainly stays in Morocco with his family, as confirmed by his lawyer. During this period, two employees from the Dutch embassy in Morocco came to request the repayment of family allowances due to his relocation. According to reports, these reimbursements were made correctly. Eventually, in 2009, Ridouan is removed from the records of the Dutch municipality where he once resided. This is a tactic often used by many criminals to evade the watchful eye of the authorities. However, in 2009, an event occurs that will indirectly have a major impact on Ridouan's destiny and will link him to his future sworn enemy, Ibrahim B., also known by the nickname The Butcher. This nickname is not coincidental. Ibrahim's father had opened the first Moroccan butcher shop in Amsterdam in the 1970s which was highly successful due to its sale of halal meat. In other words, Ibrahim grew up in an affluent family and lacked nothing. However, tragedy strikes when his father passes away suddenly when Ibrahim is only 17 years old. Everything changes for him from that point on. He must take over the family business, but at the same time, he becomes more deeply involved with his childhood friend known as Big Baghdad, who is heavily active in the criminal underworld. Deprived of his father's moral influence, Ibrahim plunges irreversibly into the underground world, rising to the position of a fearsome character who doesn't hesitate to call on his henchmen from the former Yugoslavia to collect debts, which miraculously gets settled after the first warning. For Ibrahim's family, it is a real shock to discover that this once benevolent man now has a significant criminal record. According to persistent rumors, he even managed to escape from prison by bribing a police officer to have one of his lookalikes incarcerated in his place. In 2009, a decisive event occurred when several individuals from former Yugoslavia, forming an armed commando, made a dramatic entrance into a coffee shop named Good Good in Amsterdam. The owner of the establishment, Said Fagos, 
was abducted without a trace and remained completely missing for several months. During this period, he was even presumed dead. However, against all odds, he managed to escape from his captors four months later, in 2010, fleeing from a villa located in Belgium. Said Fogos reappeared at a gas station, still bearing the marks of the abuse he endured. According to his statements, he revealed that his ankles were chained and fixed to the floor, preventing any movement. He also mentioned that during his captivity, he received regular food and drinks, but despite that, he lost a considerable amount of weight. The consequences of the mistakes made by the kidnappers ultimately led to the arrest one year later of the infamous butcher and his business partner Baghdad. Both individuals were suspected to be the masterminds behind the kidnapping. However, due to lack of sufficient evidence, their cases were quickly dropped. It later emerged that the butcher had discreetly hinted to the police that his friend Baghdad was responsible for the mission. These insinuations created irreparable tension between the two men operating in Utrecht and likely led to their separation. As the relationship between these two significantly cooled down, our main character, Ridwan, kept a low profile for an extended period. Except for a few traffic fines and minor convictions from his younger days, nothing can be found in the police database before 2015. The little one appears to have transformed into a model citizen, allowing him to outshine all his rivals in the underworld. However, all of this changes abruptly, precisely on June the 27th, 2015, when the butcher surrenders to the police out of fear for his life. I am being pursued by Ridwan Tahi. Who is he? He is a key player in the coke trade in the Netherlands. The detectives are taken aback by the butcher's revelation, as they have never heard of this man before. At that time, they make a mistake by misspelling Radoan Tahi as Re instead of Re. The butcher also discloses that his former friend, Baghdad, is now working in Tahi's organization. They are together. It has become a group. During this interrogation, he mentions possible issues related to the previous kidnapping, while maintaining denial about his involvement. The authorities, eager to deepen their investigation and piece together the puzzle, further explore the available evidence. It is during this process that they uncover that in 2013, a specialized intelligence unit, the TCI, in the process of gathering information about the criminal underworld, received a statement from an informant. A certain Ridwan Taki is involved in the trafficking and liquidations related to coke on an international scale. However, unlike the information currently provided by the butcher, this TCI report was not reliable enough to be used in police cases. This marked the starting point for intensive investigations into the man who would become the most wanted fugitive in the Netherlands, investigations that would span several years. To better understand the rest of the story, it is essential to consider the context in Amsterdam, where the Mokro War rages between two rival groups since the disappearance of a significant drug shipment in the port of Antwerp in 2012. After each liquidation, investigators notice that the fugitives use stolen cars to escape crime scenes. One striking example is the execution of one of the group's leaders, Gwinnett Martha, in 2014. Essentially, as long as criminals enrich themselves in silence, it hardly concerns the citizens. As the situation continues to escalate, the media keeps reporting on it, shedding light on everything, including the fact that innocent people are becoming targets, prompting the police to further deepen their investigations. 
Approaching spring on March the 9th, 2015, as part of the 26-tier investigation on stolen cars, a police team observes two individuals driving a stolen Audi S5 in Rotterdam. They later hand over the car to a third suspect at a gas station. Through phone conversations intercepted, it is confirmed that the resale price of this car model ranges between €3,200 and €3,800. Facing this suspicious transfer, the police discreetly decide to place a tracking device under the Audi during a brief stop in Utrecht. The Audi continues its journey, leading the investigators to a garage located in Maurik. After further research, the detectives discover that the owner of the garage is already known to the authorities and occupies another parking box as well. Suspecting potential criminal activity, the detectives decide to secretly enter the second box, where they make a troubling discovery, another stolen Audi, this time an RS6. Inside the vehicle, they find two bottles filled with gasoline, suggesting a classic modus operandi for potentially setting the car on fire after a possible liquidation. Without hesitation, both garages are equipped with cameras and listening devices, giving rise to a new investigation called 26 Copper. After over two months of inactivity, several men, including the fearsome Jawed W, who is already suspected of being involved in a murder, suddenly open one of the garage doors. The efforts to put this group under surveillance are intensified to understand their intentions. On the same day, a recorded conversation reveals a problem with the battery of the Audi S5, causing difficulties with starting and lighting. A few days later, on May 22nd, the car is moved to another garage for repairs before being returned to its original location. This coincides with a recorded financial transaction of 1,000 euros, intended to cover the expenses for getting the cars in good working condition. It is observed on multiple occasions that the suspects wear gloves and mention during various conversations the importance of leaving no traces, which explains the regular cleaning done with a product containing ammonia. These elements allow the surveillance team for the 26 Copper investigation to create a detailed profile of the group, with its core members being Jawad, Ayub, Zakaria and Levi, although their meetings may vary in composition. During the same period, the police surveillance team closely monitors the movements of Zakaria and Ayub, who regularly head to a warehouse in Neuachheim. They use a personal access code for storage unit number 40. The frequency of their visits to this location leaves little doubt about its significance for their activities. Furthermore, audio recordings highlight that the individuals have established a true training center, teaching methods to efficiently and systematically eliminate their rivals. All we did was to get these cars in order. Today, everything is finally fixed. And shortly after, it's a matter of guns. If he tells us to quickly prepare those things, bam, in 10 minutes, everything is ready to go. Yeah. The 26 Copper Group is quickly ready to carry out liquidations with an efficiency worthy of a police tactical unit. On that day, Zakaria gives instructions to Levy during shooting practice in a forest at Vec Bay Durstead which can also be heard. Continue. After that, the sound of gunshots is heard again. Then, Zakaria adds, It was good, right? After which, the sound of loading can be heard again, identified by an expert as the characteristic noise of an AK-47 assault rifle. A few weeks later, on June the 13th, 2015, in the same city, Levy and Ayub retrieve weapons from the basement of a house and transport them in a sports bag to the warehouse in Neuachheim. 
it is worth noting that they make six unsuccessful attempts to enter the access code, which appears to be similar to that of Storage Unit 40. Finally, a third person allows them to enter. On the other side, the same day, a GPS tracker is activated under the rental car of a potential target. To preserve their anonymity, we will refer to this individual as X. A few days later, Zakaria engages in a conversation with Jawad, discussing the individuals on whom they need to focus their attention. He arrives around 6, 7 o'clock. You know that he leaves his house. You know it's perfect, especially if you have a silencer. It's done. You know it will. He should be removed. Just let him rot. He'll be gone in no time. It's really not a problem. Really not. In fact, we should just take care of that bald guy again. That bald guy and that Yugo guy. In this case, Yugo refers to Ranko Szczekic, who is a confidant of the butcher. It is evident that the members of 26 Copper hope that, through individuals in the inner circle of the butcher, such as Ranko and the bald guy, among others, they will eventually locate the elusive butcher, who remains well hidden. He'll take us there, 100%. Why are they always together in these hotels? A little later, Joad adds, First, we need to find out which car this friend drives, the bald guy or the other two. During subsequent police searches, SD cards containing videos will also be found. One of these sequences was filmed on November the 17th, 2014, in the immediate vicinity of the Carlton President Hotel in Utrecht, where members of the butcher's entourage can be seen sitting unsuspectingly in a room. In the video, the voices of the 26 Copper team can even be heard discussing it. Move back a little more, that way we can also film the other man. Let's go back to the situation in June 2015. The detectives, aware of the placed tracking device and their observations on the group 26 Copper, are aware of the potential risks. In such a scenario, where an imminent liquidation is possible, they make the decision to warn X. They know that when it comes to silencers for a gun, it's not for making threats. X, taken aback by the news, declares concisely that it's not him, but the butcher who is being targeted, seemingly for assassination, and thus he relays a message. A few days later, on June 27th, 2015, as mentioned earlier, the butcher drives from his hideout in Belgium to the headquarters of the National Criminal Investigation Division in Driebergen. Terrified, he reports a threat on his life and claims to be on a blacklist. The individual in question, accustomed to going to the mosque near Utrecht Central Station in his armoured car, states that he fled to Belgium after being pursued by three men of Surinamese or Antillian origin. Among them, he identifies one of the individuals as a resident of Nuraheim, working for Tahi, identified as Joad from the monitored group 26 Copper, known by the witness for easily getting rid of people. On July 15th, 2015, marking the conclusion of the 26 Copper investigation, the police conduct a major raid. During this operation, Two storage units located in the Neuachain warehouse, numbered 40 and 161, are discovered. Inside, a veritable arsenal is uncovered, with nearly 100 firearms, 9 grenades and 13 bulletproof vests. These spaces were rented not only by Werner, but also by his sister at his request, specifically for storage unit number 161. Furthermore, Werner, considered the financier of the group, had a notebook containing all the accounting documentation, revealing transactions totaling an estimated 19 million euros over a period of one and a half years. 
According to the court, this was a highly professional organization that, if not dismantled quickly, would have caused serious disruptions in society. During a search at one of the suspect's locations, investigators discovered the presence of 90 encrypted PGP phones valued at at least 99,000 euros used to maintain secret communications. Following the analysis of the seized notebook, it was discovered that a payment of 3,500 euros had been made for the purchase of an Audi S5, which corresponds to the amounts mentioned earlier. After finding the Audi's key, it was evident that it could not be used to electronically open or close the car. This clearly indicated that the key had been falsified. During his testimony in court, Zakaria stated that he was limited to repairing cars for sale and had no knowledge of their origin. However, he became more reserved when the court asked for clarification about a recorded conversation in which he suggested to his interlocutor that it would be better to shoot at the back of the head, otherwise he would never forget the victim's face. I don't remember. It has nothing to do with the liquidations. With what then? Right to remain silent. Regarding Werner, he denied being the writer of the group's notebook. However, after a graphological test and fingerprint identification, the expert concluded that it was indeed him. Werner dismissed the expert's conclusion, calling it pseudoscientific. The code of silence, or omerta, is deeply ingrained. And at this stage, the identity of the man believed to be Ridwan Tahi, the mastermind behind the killing squad, still remains undisclosed. It was also observed that some former members of the bad boys were present in the 26 copper group, which, according to investigators, might function as a specialized unit tasked with taking necessary measures in case of conflict with rivals within the drug organization as a whole. Despite this, Ridwan is doing everything in his power to find the butcher, who is once again in hiding, and he is not at all convinced by the ease with which the arrests were made in the 26 Copper investigation. Or could it be that someone else has collaborated with the police? Isn't it imperative to find him as soon as possible?